Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here in Treaty One territory, that is the territory of the Anishinaabe, Oak Cree, Anishinaabeg, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, of course, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Roostertown. Though it may be a little dreary outside tonight, we are gathered here for what I believe to be an appropriately joyous event. That is, of course, the launch of the debut collection of poetry from Chimwemwe Yundi, Scientific Marvel. I just have a few quick housekeeping notes and then I'll turn things over to the people you are actually here to listen to. There will be a reading from this podium here, followed by a conversation hosted by Charlene Deal, which will take place at the chairs over to my left. There will then be an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you are here and have a question, please just put your hand up and I will rush to you with the microphone. This is just to ensure that those watching at home can hear your question. If you are one of those people watching at home, please feel free to write any queries you might have in the chat and we will put them to the author as time permits. Following the event, I'll have some incredibly exciting news about signing procedure for you, but the only thing I will instill in your brain right now is that we'll ask you all to remain in place to ensure that we can safely get our author over to the signing table first, at which point you can come over and get a copy of the book signed. Uh, we're very grateful to House of Anansi Press for publishing this collection, of course, and to all of you for joining us. I'm going to let you in on a not particularly well-kept secret, and that is that Chimwe Moyundi is an incredible poet, and Scientific Marvel is a beautiful testament to her work thus far. This is work that you previously had to seek out live at a reading or gratefully stumble across in the pages of a literary journal. Um, Chimwe Moyundi is probably the only poet uh, who is publishing a book now where I have been chastised uh, as the person who runs the poetry section for not having any of her poetry on the shelf already, even before a book of her work was published. So <laughs> it's a testament to the power of her writing this book that it has not left our bestseller list since the moment it touched down in store as well. Though. So, I'd uh, typically be loath to quantify her work using such a nakedly capitalistic rubric, although as a bookseller, it does my heart good. So instead, I will now defer aesthetically to the publisher and a fellow poet for some comments on this beautiful book before I turn things over to the author herself. Firmly grounded in the local, the arresting poems in Chimwemwe Yundi's debut collection, Scientific Marvel are preoccupied with Winnipeg in the way a Winnipegger is preoccupied with Winnipeg, the way a poet might be preoccupied with herself through history and immigration, race and gender, anxieties, and observation. And I would be foolish if I did not take any opportunity to quote an author of the caliber of Kinesia Lubrin, author of the mind rearranging brilliant books, Code Noir, The Disgraphist, Voodoo Hypothesis, who says, scientific marvel is poetic anti-gravity, poetry of the lightest touch for the heftiest matters, and so lit by its poet's willingness to tarry with the things only poetry can illuminate. Its music blooms with defined wit. Sharp, pointed, and sage about the world and its endangered moving parts, the great reward of Undi's meticulous attention is ours to reap, whether it is trained close to home or beyond. But even more, Undi has proven herself an exquisite and needful diarist of the inextricability of Black being from love, from freedom, from the tangled, hurtful web of this modern life. At the core of this book is always the heart-stirring necessity of surprise, a queerly marvelous debut. Now, of course, the author after the reading will be talking to the host, my good friend Charlene Deal, who is a writer, editor, performer, former English professor, and the longtime director of the Winnipeg International Writers Festival. She has published poetry, essays, reviews, and a superlative memoir, Out of Grief Singing, a memoir of motherhood and loss. She co edited a jazz magazine for a dozen years and is the producer of the Izzy Asper Jazz Performances. In 2019, she was justifiably honored with the Winnipeg Arts Council's Making a Difference Award for her contributions to the local arts community. 
Some of you may have heard of our guest of honor this evening. Uh, Chimomo Yundi is a poet, editor, and lawyer living and working on Treaty One territory here in Winnipeg. Her work has appeared in Brick, Border Crossings, Canadian Literature, and BBC World, among others. She was the recipient of the 2022 John Hirsch Emerging Writer Award for the Manitoba Book Awards, and she is the Winnipeg Poet Laureate for 2023 and 2024. It is my enormous pleasure and privilege to ask you to join me in giving an inappropriately raucous welcome <laughs> to Jim Wendy. a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> Winnipeg poem. One, a reference to the famously frigid winters, often by way of reference to winter clothing or activities. Two, for obvious reasons, the phrase prairie sky. Three, lamenting, general. Four, lamenting, winter specific. <laughs> Five, invoking John K. Sampson explicitly or by prosody. Six, a reference to the history of the name Winnipeg being murky water in an Inamoan. Seven, a passing or wrote reference to Indigenous peoples, post-2015 apologetic in nature. Eight, a mention of local flora, typically in metaphor, for example, lilac, choke cherry, birch, milkweed, Saskatoon berry, thistle, goldenrod, prairie grass, etc. Nine, a mention of local fauna, typically in metaphor, for example, deer tick, black fly, skeeter, canker worm, pigeon, crow, etc. Ten, a reference to the forking of the red in the Cinnaboyne rivers and or to the forks. 11, a reference to Salisbury House, <laughs> Sal's, and pre-2019, Stella's Restaurants. <laughs> 12, Porringe and Main, and or Confusion Corner, and or The Golden Boy. 13, invoking Guy Madden's My Winnipeg, explicitly or in tone. 14, Grain, etc. <laughs> Um, if I can get through this evening without crying, we'll call that a success. Um, wow. Uh, this feels like my wedding, but I'm not in debt afterwards. <laughs> uh, I'm so grateful to each and every one of you for being here. Uh, ooh, okay. Um, it's probably best if I just keep reading poems. Uh, this uh, first, second poem uh, is titled Property 101. This I know how to do. Reduce a person to their facts, unsympathetic to condition, either useful or distinct. Good practice is dissolving my beloved into traits, serving the language that I serve and work against to do. I am advised that an example of violence is not violence, like a photograph in a museum transformed by the lens and then by display. Because I am advised, I turn an advisory, surmise the gaps from not openings with, through which to shine my particular night. Dark is the din of this country's measured silence. This is to say I am learning about property in a recent nation for no one looks me in the eye, but spectacle elides by calling itself analysis. Hallways riddled with exits, each an error to pass. Thanks. Um, this next pair of poems 
I love explaining to people because they don't make any sense. Um, okay. They're about, I guess I started uh, thinking about climate change. Uh, that's not true. I'm always thinking about climate change um, and people around me um, are starting to think about having children. Um, hi Maeve. <laughs> uh, my good friend had a baby a couple weeks ago um, and I thought you know I would have a kid if I could grow it in a jar it's a song for anything unborn song for anything unborn we have jam jars from Christmas so we start there my eggs in his eyes viscid on the yellow sill, floating like sliced peaches in real juice. In the bathroom where the light is best with the door closed so the cat can't lap liquid from the mouth, left open to aerate and stir gently like the book says to do. In the dark, I scold myself for being too afraid and not afraid enough, think, Better this than three-fourths of one year making a promise that is also a betrayal. We can barely promise now, never mind a future to suffer through. We'll raise you, pin our hopes to you, explain what birds were and waterfalls, how you started on a windowsill in a countertop Tupperware where you rose to flesh like yeast, fed the spiked thing inside me that turns me all edges. It's hard to explain, so I won't. Like all daughters of your year, you will hear me crying from the hallway, see me emerge chipper and lacking in explanation, twisting open yellow cans of beans. He will awake with your soft hair in his mouth. Watching you churn in your thrifted glass, I hope you beat this ending here and no one mistakes you for a left thing and feeds your dark liquid to the thirst in their mouth. What birds were? Yeah, animals and small and spined. No, not unlike a dog, say dog, but with feathers. And, and not always, and not always small. Oh, a feather is a kind of leaf. They were good, the birds, yes, and some of them were kind of bad. They made eggs, you've seen an egg, remember? Oh, a uh, flight is a kind of movement that acknowledges its limitations. A beak is like a sharp mouth. The same sky, say sky, but blue and before falling and you would look and there would be, yeah, small animal, that's close, with a body of bones so light it grew wings, say wings, instead of hands. Two very different directions to go in. Um, let's go vulgar and then legal. Uh, <laughs> uh, so like many people in this room, some of them elected officials, I spent a lot of time in my 20s at Club 200, um, which is a, a queer club here in Winnipeg. Um, and this is a poem that I wrote from a special place. Uh, to that club. Owed to 200 from each of my tits. <laughs> Mostly the left one, which is slightly smaller, less panicked in lace. Under identical black mesh crop top, we each arrive in having coordinated nothing but our briefly mirrored lives. I mean, a red lip and pixels do not even approach analogy. For one, do not convey the body glitter pooling. My tits should sigh briefly into gravity in the stall where I pull center gore from chest and swipe sweat from under underwire. Much like on my body, they should feature heavily 
revel in their first best destiny, high over rib cage, belly, ass. You should be crouched in the next stall, scream guessing lyrics full tilt, something juniper sweet defying surface tension in a plastic shot glass. You should be naming them for any worthy pair. Tia and twin, Simon, Garfunkel, Hall, Oates, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> and all of us, as all of us, going out, coming out, bright under dollar store disco ball over cardboard cured potholes, cardboard lengthened cocktail table legs, circled the shoulder with every still and unkissed girl. My tip should be pressed against another pair, against the lower abdomen of a tall person, wet with the back sweat of whoever will prom Poseman demanded. They should harden to name me direction when we cool onto sidewalk into sweet morning smoke. They should burrow under thrifted full fur coat to live and fear free animals. A bosom to be spied across a narrow gym crack floor, to jiggle to VLT percuss dance hall, to heave and heft and be gathered into. I should awake hoarse from screaming songs onto joyful house, on joyful earth, adorned with whatever is beautiful and nearby. I want us together under light scattered by a disregarded thing, breathing identical air, air wet with what rises from gathered bodies, stickied floor, a signal to stay. <laughs> Um, so there are a couple of centos in the collection. Uh, a cento is, there's people in here who have like degrees in poems, so I'm just going to say it as I understand it, which is uh, poems that are expressly built from outside sources. In this case, those sources are like legislation and uh, scholarly papers and critical discourse analysis. Um, and this poem is called Sori Cento. An apology is an expression of sympathy or regret. In some nations, an acknowledgement will suffice. An apology is not necessarily an admission of guilt. In some places, an apology means something like not sorry. A good apology can be a humiliating act. A good apology may detract from the apologizer's symbolic power. An apology is remedial work a gesture which splits the individual into two parts. An acknowledgement of responsibility may express self-deficiency. An apology should include an explanation or account. An explicit expression might be an offer of apology. For example, I am sorry. An explicit expression might be a request for forgiveness. An acknowledgement of responsibility may offer repair or redress. For example, I will make it up to you. An apology is an illocutionary force wherein the truth of the express proposition is presupposed. The defining features of an apology are admissions of blameworthiness and regret for an undesirable event. An acknowledgement of responsibility is part of a good apology. For example, accepting the blame a good apology includes a promise of forbearance. For example, it will never happen again. Um, I'm going to end with a couple of poems um, that are not in the collection. One, because I didn't write it. And I know. I go to like music concerts and musicians do this. And I'm like, why are you playing things that I don't know? Um, but <laughs> I don't think we have the same relationship with one another. Um, <laughs> this first poem is by June Jordan. Uh, and the second poem is after June Jordan. And uh, this is Intifada Incantation, poem number eight for BBL uh, by June Jordan. I said I loved you and I wanted genocide to stop. I said I loved you and I wanted affirmative action and reaction. I said I loved you and I wanted music out the windows. 
I said I loved you and I wanted nobody thirst and nobody, nobody cold. I said I loved you and I wanted, I wanted justice under my nose. I said I loved you and I wanted boundaries to disappear. I wanted nobody roll back the streets. I wanted nobody take away daybreak. I wanted nobody freeze all the people on their knees. I wanted you. I wanted your kiss on the skin of my soul. And now you say you love me and I stand despite the trillion treacheries of sand. You say you love me and I hold the longing of the winter in my hand. You say you love me and I commit to friction and the undertaking of the pearl. You say you love me, you say you love me. And I have begun, I begin to believe maybe, maybe you do. I am tasting myself in the mouth of the sun. This is the uses of fish, um, an epigraph from a different Drew Jordan poem, uh, which goes to you, follow me. We are the wrong people of the wrong skin on the wrong continent. And what in the hell is everybody being reasonable about? In the first year that it could be called the past, still bloomed at the borders and in the graveyards. And the graveyards were the streets where my people died like dogs. In that very year, that first blush of history, I was born scaled, unscathed, and aspiring to nuance. I took my grandma's name and a lamb was slaughtered in the world and in the name of God and the name meant lamb. In my dreams, my screens are windows, and even here, I pass by tassel and through to the new school of unmaking. I am taught and teach myself to peddle in precedent, what's happened should happen, and abstraction. What precisely do you mean by happening? In this very here, in the black I was born under, I am newly history. I make a new and hollow sound. Even in my dreams, I learn the truth is something that you sigh. I learn to loosen fists, to lower quiet hands, to hold myself and to hold myself back, to pause my pointer over empty sentiments and then repeat them, all my questions in the other room. The word apartheid is in Afrikaans, so when I say it, it reminds me what it did. It was a long war and it is still going. You can taste it in the fruit. Our aunties kept safe houses by the border. Our grandfathers kept their past books in the jackets that they wore into their graves. When they drank, they kept drinking. What happened keeps on happening. Our fathers who sometimes wake up in their sleep and here we are, our father's hands and their rage their broad brownness and your hesitations, your hypotheses, your fears announced from the warmth of inner rooms. Here, in what we try to call the future, the air is still heavy with the shouted and unsaid. Thank you. Okay, we're just going to pause for a second. And for those of you who are not very experienced with poetry readings, this might be even one of your first ones. I have to say, this way of being in language and the quiet and the thinking, that was an exquisite reading. Would you please like show this to me? So as I was reading this collection, I've been reading it in bits and bobs over the last couple of weeks, and then I read it all in one sitting. And my notes are all over <laughs> everywhere because I feel like every one of these poems is like a little compact 
tangle of thoughts and words that all rush out when you when you look at them in certain ways, different ways. Uh, and over and over again, what I felt as a reader was that I was being invited to really pause and think about thinking, which is, you know, something we don't always pause to do. And also to think about language and how language helps us to think or helps us to avoid thinking. I sometimes think that a good poem, like the poems in this collection, are a little bit like a window or we might be looking through the window to something that's exterior. We might be looking a little bit at our own reflection in the window. We might also be looking at the window. What is the window and what is it made of? And I just think those dimensions are all functioning in different ways, in different poems. So I'll just start there. I love the collection. I think it's a beautiful testament to a beautiful mind. And I love to hear you thinking. So thank you for bringing us all with you. And all of you who now are going to read this book at home are going to be able to hear Jim's cadence in your ear as you read. Uh, that's a special edition. So there's lots of places to start, but let's start where you started, which is a Winnipeg poem. Um, <laughs> and you are now the poet laureate of this crazy city and have lived here a long time. And yet you are also kind of placed and displaced at the same time. I think that's how I read you in the poems and other things uh, that I've heard you read over the years that we've known each other. So maybe you could just start by talking a little bit about your sense of relationship as a person and as a poet with the city that keeps showing up in these pages. Sure. Um, yeah, so I was born in Winnipeg and then my family left and we returned to Winnipeg. Sorry, can you not hear me at all? No, it's not. Yeah. How about now? Oh, that's much better. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I was, I was born in Winnipeg and my family left and came back to Winnipeg. And so uh, there were years of my life where Winnipeg was a presence in my life, even though I had no memories of it. And then years that I was in Winnipeg um, and still, because I had spent so much time away, felt outside of it uh, and, and sort of the experience of immigrating at 12, 13, which I mean, there's already plenty going on when you're 12 or 13 years old, uh, encouraged what I think was already a tendency in me to observe what's going on around me. And so when I was, I was thinking about what to write a collection about, it felt sort of natural to turn to something that I at once knew very well and at the same time felt that I knew so little about um, and that some of the things that I've, I thought I knew about it were not necessarily accurate. Um, I talk about this book all the time, but uh, as I was sort of struggling through what to say, um, I was reading Owen Taze's Stolen City, which is a, an incredible book and a history of uh, Winnipeg that history being a, a history of, of dispossession and displacement of the first peoples here and then of subsequent generations of, uh, of people in the city. Um, and I, I sort of, the, the blurb on the book, which is about being preoccupied with Winnipeg in a way that a Winnipegger is preoccupied with Winnipeg, was it in like the, the like grant application? <laughs> <laughs> That I wrote um, <laughs> because it's so true that Winnipeggers are like obsessed with being sort of disparaging of Winnipeg, but I think often in the wrong ways. I think we're sort of criticizing some of the things that are fine and failing to criticize some of the things that we sort of take for granted. Did that answer your question at all? Because I kind of started talking and then <laughs> um, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's my first time. Yeah. First book. You're doing, you're doing great. Okay, great. <laughs> what? Okay, I'm actually just gonna just ask one little follow-up question, which is to just ask you to expand a little bit about like what does make this this city and its complexity like a, a good subject for a poem or to, for a kind of a, a thread that runs through a whole collection? What is it? Mm, I don't I don't know that it's specific to the city necessarily. Um, 
I say, I have to quote myself, I say in one of the poems that any city is a series of decisions. It's also like every person who lives in Winnipeg has a completely unique experience of the city of Winnipeg. Uh, and I'm fascinated by that. And also by the sort of overlap in uh, experiences that different people have. Um, I think writing about home, uh, however that's construed, the family home, uh, city of province and nation, an earth, um, a self it is really fascinating because just by virtue of how much we're exposed to it, we become used to or resigned to or um, blind to things about it uh, that I think are worth revisiting and, and that sort of was part of the project of this collection. I feel like the kind of patient attention to what is not immediately visible or accessible uh, runs through all these poems and is also often directed toward the speaker, the speaking self, which I know like all writers, probably not you, but it's maybe a little bit you. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I also see in this whole collection is this kind of emerging um, clarity about how to live with the both the knowledge of a self and the impossibility of having that knowledge of a self. Uh, so I would would like you to talk a bit about that, but I also wonder if you would like to map that into the few poems in here about Dean Gunnarsson because <laughs> they're kind of an interesting little side <laughs> note. <laughs> um, my, my husband's in the front row in a Dean Gunnarsson t-shirt. Um, <laughs> you must stand, stand and show everyone. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, I don't know, uh, sort of brain merge thing that is hard to explain maybe. Um, I'll start with Dean. Uh, the perfect place to start. Uh, I wrote a number of these poems when I was in residency at uh, Riding Mountain National Park, um, the fantastic program the Manitoba Arts Council and Parks Canada put together. We send artists for two weeks into what I thought was the woods, but it's, it's just like a national park, which is perfect for me. Um, <laughs> and it was by the water and, and writing. And uh, Nathan, my husband, thought I wouldn't talk about you the whole time, but here we are, um, found a deck of cards in a drawer that had images of Dean Gunnarsson in various costumes on them. Um, and I had no idea who he was, and there was very little internet connection uh, at, the, at the cottage. And so I like, went out, out onto the deck trying to get data found out that he's an escape artist like he's a magician he's a magician um and that he had tried this feat uh several years prior like in the 80s or 90s where he uh, was put in a coffin put into the river and then was supposed to escape but he ended up he says dying uh and had to be pulled up and um rescued and I thought that that was like incredible like both funny but also deeply like sad and strange the urge to put oneself sort of in relationship with the death in that way so frequently and to build a life of, of um making your own constraints and escaping from them and I was like, well, I kind of do that a little bit too. <laughs> I was gonna mention that. <laughs> yeah, we all kind of do that uh, a little bit, have sort of things that we tie ourselves to and tie ourselves up with. Um, some of the constraints obviously are imposed upon us, but I, I think it's fair to say that there are things, in my case, my own kind of preoccupations and um, insecurities that are completely my own invention. Um, anyway, I wrote a poem um, about the attempt to escape from the coffin, which ended up being the first poem that I felt, that felt to me like the start of a collection. Uh, and so it means a lot to me. And then, <laughs> and then uh, as part of the residency on the 
in the second week of the residency, you're asked to do a public engagement, and I did a reading. Uh, and we were during this time being shown around by this wonderful woman named Marjorie, who's a, a ranger at the park. And uh, I read that poem and I told that part of the story and she said, oh, Dean works here. <laughs> <laughs> He's the acting text him, like he works at this park. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, which was incredible. And I went back the following year uh, to the residency again, and Ethan and I did, and we met him and <laughs> got to see all his like cool magic stuff. And I think he couldn't really get a read on what our interest in him <laughs> was. To be fair, it's completely sincere. Um, we both have separate t-shirts just in case we both want to wear them on different days. Um, yeah. That's that. <laughs> well, I'm going to push you a little bit further because I think that the, the idea of constraints and es escape and freedom, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of a constraint, which is uh, also containment and bondage. There's some images that are really painful and difficult and scary. But also I'm thinking in terms of how a poem works or how the book works, There, every good poem is also a set of constraints that you're working within and also trying to loosen up and not die inside. Yeah, wow, you are an English professor. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't think of that. That's not my job. <laughs> you I'm going to say that in another interview and pretend that I did it on purpose. Oh, yeah, it's yours. No, that's, it's all yours. that's so true. Um, yeah, and I, in fact, like I taught a workshop on formal poetry, which I love working with, like as a starting point. Formal poetry is sort of like the forms of poems, like sonnets and it's the only one I can think of right now. Sento's, uh, yeah, Sento is a, a, a form. Um, in some ways, erasure can be considered a form, just sort of uh, structures of forms that you work inside of. And I found in this collection, starting from a structure to be really productive uh, for me. Um, there's like the first and last poem in the book are secretly American sonnets, which are a form uh, that popularized, I think, recently by Wanda Coleman and Terrence Hayes, um, because when staring at a blank page, when like the whole world is open to you, I find that more difficult than having some rules to follow or to break. Wow, what a good question, Truman. <laughs> so, that, that's so interesting. I, I have like form in capital letters yeah. in various parts of my, uh, my scratches as I was reading because there's so much variety. There's this great sort of Google search poem, which oh, yeah. I loved. And there's this, I can't remember, I actually didn't go looking up the name of the form, but you probably know it where there's repeat lines, like lines that get quoted in the next uh, stanza. Yeah, I just, definitely knew the name of that when I was writing it. But I can't yeah, remember. Probably probably yeah. yeah. There'll be a qu quiz later. Sure John probably's <laughs> looking it up. <laughs> I did want you to talk a little bit about that though, because the, when you turn the page, each page, you're looking at something that looks different mm -hmm. and has a little bit different. I always think of you know, my job as a reader is like, what is my contract right here with this? You know, what am what am I doing as my half of the of this making this thing a live project? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at a page where most of it is blacked out, I loved those, those erasure poems, which uh, I was thinking look like redaction, but are kind of more like revelation. Exactly. I yeah. just like, oh, wow, <laughs> good thinking. Uh, and I thought, I thought we were looking at often your interest in form also like right down to the, your interest in this sort of particularity of language. And as I was halfway through, I'm like, oh, right. You actually did a linguistics degree first. Mm -hmm. So you really are digging around inside those word histories and those sentence structures and all those uh, yeah, parameters that make it possible for us to live in language. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that so much of what I love about language um, are the rules of it. 
Uh, Dean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the constraints that language imposes on themselves and that as a poet, I get to do whatever I want uh, with those constraints. And that you're right that that's on like the word level. There's words in there that are not words and uh, that are not used in the right word in the right way or the expected way. Um, and that goes to the level of form where there are forms that I uh, played with and sometimes I liked where they took me and sometimes I didn't and I ignored what the rules of, of the form were. Um, but I mean, uh, what part of what I love uh, about poetry is that you can aim for precision, but yeah. how is one precise about a feeling or a sentiment? Uh, it's sort of I'm aiming for something that's impossible, but also feels possible. Because I have read poems and thought, oh yeah, exactly that. Um, but it's not clear what the goal is until you get there. Um, yeah. I feel like as a reader, I'm just going to go back to what you were saying in the beginning about everyone having a very uh, particular personal relationship to the city, for instance, or your kind of your walkthrough. And I felt like there was all this activation happening in all these poems, but I wasn't, and I could see and feel and hear all the precision, but I felt like my experience of the precision is probably not your experience of the precision, which is really what is brilliant about the poem, right? It has, it's very concrete and specific, but sort of inside the person who is unpacking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, much like every person experiences the city in a different way, every person experiences a poem in a different way. Um, that apology poem, I think, is a great example of kind of digging into the layers of language and usage and like you're sort of pulling up from different different uh, contexts and a lot of those are very academic uh, mm -hmm. settings that you're kind of repurposing mm -hmm. and you keep digging and digging and digging so what we think we know at the start by the end we know we don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> and we might want to pause and or at least have the pause of the poem to think and realize oh this is something that could use a little bit more attention and care. Yeah I mean Sora Sento specifically uh, uh, came from a place of my sort of fascination with the Canadian idea that we apologize for everything, when in fact oh, we don't acknowledge a lot of the stuff that we need to apologize for. Um, and I think I think I saw it in a stand-up routine or something that somebody mentioned that uh, many jurisdictions in, in Canada have something called the Apology Act, which uh, makes it so that um, if a person apologizes, if a person does something and apologizes, that it's not an acknowledgement of responsibility um, for legal purposes. But I thought of that as an idea, like the sort of, of apologies that we receive from um, people in power um, that sort of try and toe the line of saying, we're very sorry, but we're also not going to do anything and we're not going to do anything differently. Um, I thought it was a fun place to start. I had a lot of fun writing that poem. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this is maybe a little place to have a little sidestep and ask you to talk about uh, your your professional life as a lawyer sure. and your <laughs> sort of professional life as a poet. And how do you see those two talking to each other in one little person? Mm. Um. You know, I get asked versions of this question a lot, and I should have a better answer for it now. Um, I'm interested in language, I'm interested in power, um, and the law uh, codifies power through language. And I, I feel very privileged that I get to interact with language in my job every day. Um, but I'm also struck by um, the ways that language is used in the law and elsewhere uh, to preserve power, to hide power, to uh, disempower. Um, yeah, I, it, it sort of all comes from a place of 
interest in how we communicate with one another, with one another or, or fail to communicate with one another. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, I like words. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm interested in how they work. My uh, sort of my degrees in linguistics um, were focused on critical discourse analysis, which asks questions about precisely that, how, how language um, and power work together and what they work together to do. Uh, and that has very clearly seeped into my poetic writing too. People ask me about like whether the law influences my writing and it does, but so does everything. Every, every register of communication that I um, engage with or I'm exposed to influences the way that I write. Um, it just so happens that the law is very interesting, both in the sort of formal drafting legislation of it, and also the way that people talk to each other, uh, the way that lawyers talk to each other is very funny and strange. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I have like a spidey sense that goes on when I hear interesting language and I think, why, why that? Why are we talking that way? What are we doing or trying not to do when we communicate in certain ways? Um, and, and that spidey sense is internal and is flagged by anything and is always on. I'm thinking about the passive voice poem. Mm -hmm. And I'm also thinking about, I, I don't know if all, I think maybe all of the, the, re, the redaction of the, the erasure poems are working with uh, legal texts, aren't they? Yeah. If you don't know what an erasure poem is, that, what's that what they're called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I'll just show you. These are the poems that are going to be quite quick to read because they only have a few words. <laughs> <laughs> Look like that. So there's a whole block of text, but almost all of it is taken out. Yeah. And then there's a different little thread of story kind of emerges from all that, all the stuff that's been removed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the ocean came up and washed all the stuff away and just left the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are really fascinating. Yeah, there's a sort of a tradition of erasure by Black writers that I was very influenced by. Um, and I, I heard Christina Sharp talking about... Before you all wrote this, is you wrote this? Would you mind signing it for me? Oh. Um, uh, sir, we can take care of that following oh. the event itself, but thank you very much. Would you mind you, taking you, a seat? Do you have a pen? Uh, sir, I'm sorry, we don't have pens, and the signing will take place immediately following. Oh, the okay, event. all right. So we'll just beg your patience yeah, okay. and just start right. the liquor like store anyway. I'll come back. Okay. Thank you. Apparently, it's a really good book. That he told me. <laughs> 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 you guys all agree? It's a great book. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where were we? Um, <laughs> ever a dumb erasure poem. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. So Christina Sharp talks about erasure as um, revealing what was not uh, meant to be seen. Uh, she said it's smarter than that, but I'm a bit distracted. Um, and uh, so the erasures in the collection are all erasures of decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, which is the highest court in the land uh, where the affected party was um, a black person and where uh, both in the decisions themselves and in sort of my education, uh, that blackness was not contended with in a way uh, that considered what effect the blackness had on the affected parties um, experiences and their decisions that I think about, particularly Baker, um, is, is one that I think about all the time because it's foundational to a lot of the work that I do. Um, but in sort of writing these poems and working with these texts, I could find very little about Mavis Baker, uh, who's the affected party, who is a mentally ill Black woman, um, an, an immigrant, a refugee seeking. Um, 
to, to stay in Canada who encountered an expressly overtly racist um, uh, decision-making process. Um, and those poems, I should say, oh, what I call in the book, An Intellectual Debt to Work by Dr. Amar Kode, uh, who is a professor at the U of M and who wrote a paper about Grant sort of doing what the poems aim to do, which is unpacking some of the narrative that is alighted in the decisions themselves and, and in our education of them. And I had been struggling with how to speak about the experience of being in a classroom and learning about a decision and being like, well, that was definitely racism. Mm -hmm. um, that seems very obvious to me that this black man was stopped because he was black, but we're sort of dancing around that topic uh, and that uh, scholarly work by Dr. Kode opened up for me the possibility that the answer I was looking for was in the, the decision, even if it wasn't placed there on purpose. So you kind of released that in a way. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are really powerful poems. Thank you. I think we could probably shift into a question space. Yeah. Do any of you have questions that you'd like to ask Chimamwe? Nothing hard. <laughs> <laughs> She will sign the book later, so if you're curious about that. <laughs> if anyone has a gentle probing question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and if no questions are, oh, yes. So, Tim, you've told us over the course of the reading and the questions about some of the influences, explicit and implicit, that went into the book, June Jordan and Christina Sharp, and uh, as professor at the U of M, and obviously John Sampson. <laughs> um, and I would just love to hear about anybody else that you read or were thinking about or returned to while you were writing the book um, and, and working on the poems. I just always love hearing about the the textual influences that writers bring in. So anything more you want to say about that? Yeah, I love that question. Um, yeah, I read a lot of poetry. Um, when writing these, one writer who I feel that I owe a great debt to is Terrence Hayes. Um, I've had sort of started the manuscript already and reading about, reading Terrence Hayes collections and how he, um, makes them cohere uh, was really helpful for me in understanding how to make a book work. Um, I love his writing. Uh, sort of on a more philosophical level, I would say, uh, like Kayla Zaga, Ross Gay, um, who else? I'm thinking of writers who I turn to for um, a reminder that a poem can be about something very ordinary um, but still be profound in some way and, and uh, Ross Gay's Book of Delights which sort of really got me through <laughs> got me through uh, lockdown sort of turning his attention and his careful and loving attention to ordinary things that delight him uh, was really helpful for me and to feel less like talking about what made me happy was <laughs> frivolous and that I should only talk about things that make me sad or angry. Um, sure, there's a lot more, but I'll leave it. Oh, Kinesia, obviously. Uh, oh my goodness, yeah. Kinesia Lubrin, um, Voodoo Hypothesis was sort of like a foundational collection for me. I, I love that collection very much. Uh, and then I studied with her at Banff in 2019 as part of the Emerging Writers program. She gave me great advice, which is you just have to write the book, um, which is exactly what I needed to hear. Uh, and then the dysgraphist, um, which undoes language in a way that I can only aspire to, is, is so, um, yeah, aspirational. Uh, and so her blurbing the, the book meant a lot to me for, for various reasons, but, but that's one of them. Uh, what was your process for sort of ordering of the poems in the book? How did you go about doing that? And what was your process for it? Um, that was very hard. Um, Leslie Joy Ahenda, who is 
one of the people that I, I met and worked with at Banff and who now works at House of Nancy literally got on a FaceTime call with me and we went through the book, uh, through the poems one by one. Um, and Leslie helped me think about sort of what do I want to start with and what do I want to end with, which seem like stupid questions, but are like exactly what I was struggling with. What impression, what first impression do I want to give? And then what do I want people to take away? Um, and not just in terms of content, but in terms of um, sort of emotion or character. Like the, the first poem is a little sarcastic. And the last poem is also a little sarcastic, but a little funnier, uh, I think. Um, and that kind of thread was one that I wanted to pull through the collection. It was hard. I did also want the erasures to be spaced out. Um, I thought about putting them in um, a section together, but I wanted them to appear and then reappear and then appear differently and then appear long and then appear strange. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking about. Thanks, Joe, for the question. So we have these two questions right here, and then we'll go to closing comments from our featured guests. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the poems that you chose to share here today. I was curious about the book cover, uh, how that might relate to the poems in your, in your collection. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious about that, too. <laughs> Uh, I'm kidding. I love the cover uh, very much. Um, but the process at Anansi is that I sent the manuscript. They sent the manuscript off to an artist. They asked me uh, what I liked and hated in covers, and I gave them really confusing information about that. Um, and then they sent me back. In retrospect, I think they might have sent me a couple that were like tricks because they were so obviously not what I was looking for. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, it's a good strategy. <laughs> it's, it's, honestly, with me, it's very helpful. Uh, hate making decisions famously. Um, but yeah, I saw the cover and I was like, that is not at all what I was expecting. I do not understand how you got there. And it's exactly right. Um, it's exactly what I want. Yeah. It's kind of like a poem, too. Mm -hmm. Hi, I was just uh, wondering the title, and there's a few poems, if you could talk a little bit about the inspiration you find downtown in the core area of the city. Sure. Um, yeah. Oh, what a great question to end on. Um, I love downtown Winnipeg, and my heart really aches for downtown Winnipeg. Um, I... I live downtown, I work downtown. I love being able to get to things on foot. I love uh, living close to my neighbors and my neighbors have all different um, circumstances and life experiences. And I like that I am exposed to other people who are having a harder time and an easier time than I am. Um, and title Scientific Marvel comes from a beauty school in downtown Winnipeg that I've never been to and don't know anything about, um, but I loved the phrase the scientific marble as a way of thinking about poems and also just the sound, started with the sound and then worked backwards into the meaning. Um, and right now it's an empty storefront and there's graffiti and random posters on it. And I'm kind of pro graffiti, I think it's cool, but um, it is, it's hard, uh, to love and hope for something uh, so much um, and, and to, to see its struggle, especially sort of post, uh, you know, the main part of the pandemic, um, things have, have really become more difficult downtown. Um, yeah, I, I, I love living close to my neighbors. I love uh, Porter's Place Mall. I have a poem in the book about Porter's Place Mall, uh, and I genuinely just think it's beautiful in there. <laughs> just the, the light in there is, is beautiful. I love uh, thinking about uh, the Hydro Building as sort of an emblem for what Hydro has done in this province. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of very big feelings about downtown. I hope you all spend more time 
down there uh, with me and I feel like a Jets game every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just be hanging out. Okay. Yeah. Ready now. Um, we, we wait for the Wizard of Oz to show up. Oh, I was going to suggest if you have any closing comments, I'd like to hear. <laughs> Where is that voice coming from? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say it again. I'll say it probably for the rest of my life. Um, I'm so grateful uh, that all of you are here, that each and every one of you are here, who I know from like every part of my life, you know, it, all no different versions of, of me. Um, I am really just moved that you uh, braved the rain and came and sat in this room with me to hear me just talk and talk and talk. Um, yeah, thank you for the support for this book and, and throughout my writing career in, in, in various ways. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. I'm so happy. I think we should ask her to have a little cry now. Do you think she's trying not to cry? Not to cry. No? I don't know if my eyeliner is uh, waterproof. Um, yeah, and thank you, Charlene, for hosting. Charlene is like one of my earliest supporters, one of the first people who supported in a way, me in a way that made me think, oh, I'm like a writer. Like, I write stuff. So cool. I heard you do one slam, and I was like, okay, I got, I got my eye on that one. And here you are. It's, yeah. it's really wonderful to watch the, the maturing Thank of you. Tim's poetic voice. Congratulations. It really is a splendid accomplishment. Thank you so much. We will now move along to the signing portion of the evening. Uh, so we'll ask you all just to remain in place for one brief moment while we safely transport Jim Wamuyundi across the store. Uh, you'll find the poet at a table just beside our cash desk. I'll let you know when it's good for all of you to come over and get in line to get books signed. There are books at the table. There are books at our center cash desk. Please do feel free to get a book uh, signed before you pay for it, but please do remember to pick up a book. <laughs> We're so very grateful to all of you who came out to join us here in person. Of course, enormously grateful to House of Anansi for publishing this book and for making uh, this evening a possibility and grateful to all of you who are watching online as well. I'm now going to ask you to join me in offering two more rounds of applause. The first is of course, to our host for the evening, Charlene Deal. <laughs> And this brilliant book is Scientific Marvel. Its brilliant author is Jimon Moyundi. Thank you 